thank you everyone for coming. Uh, I'm going to let Nicole hand it off to Nicole Gardner, our uh, director of Career Launch. Thank you very much, Brian, and warm welcome to all of you. Thank you so much for coming. We're excited to have you. Um, I, as Brian said, my name is Nicole Gardner, and I'm the director of Career Launch at Perkins. Uh, Career Launch is an innovative training and career services program helping blind and visually impaired young adults land career track jobs. In our 14-month program, we train young adults in the field of customer success and help them find, apply for, and succeed in entry-level career track-oriented jobs. Tonight, we're launching a new speaker series, and we are so proud to welcome Veronica Lewis as our first guest. In this series, we'll showcase people with visual disabilities who have led exemplary lives in work and in their personal lives. These people are extraordinary role models for our career launch trainees and alumni, as well as students at Perkins School for the Blind, and indeed for us all. With that, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Brian, who will be in conversation with Veronica tonight. But first, I wanna take a moment to introduce you to Brian. So Brian is our access technology instructor in Career Launch, and he works with our participants to develop their skills in office systems and tools, including everything from effectively browsing the web to working efficiently in office tools such as Salesforce, Microsoft Office, and Google Suite. He also teaches obviously access technology and how to use it effectively when working in mainstream office technology. He also holds my hand during technology crises for which I'm very grateful. Um, as someone with a visual impairment, Brian brings to the classroom a lifetime's worth of experience being visually impaired. He holds a master's degree in public policy, focusing on disability policy and teaching licenses as well in secondary and middle school mathematics, biology, and English with SEI endorsement. Out of the classroom, Brian's an avid athlete and has consulted on accessibility of fitness apps such as RunKeeper and Strava. Brian's also an active, active advocate for members of the deafblind community, serving on the Massachusetts State Rehabilitation Council and working with DBCAN, the Deafblind Community Access Network. Finally, Brian's a contributing author to a book about living with deafblindness called Walk in My Shoes, an anthology on Usher syndrome, and a second book about service dogs called Walk in My Paws, an anthology on service dogs. Ryan and Veronica, over to you. Thank you so much, Nicole. Uh, and I'm very excited to have Veronica Lewis um, here with us. Um, most of you guys probably know her more famously at Veronica with Four Eyes. Uh, she is the creator of the AT uh, blog website called uh, Veronica with Four Eyes. Uh, she started in 2016. Uh, it's all about low vision asset technology or a set of technology uh, and with being a student um, of a set of technology and data science as well and uh, she is a young professional with a visual impairment and a few medical conditions as well uh, and she strived to be um, the role model that uh, she wanted uh, someone to be able to look up to uh, very amazing individual um, and I'm very excited to have her with us. Um, thank you so much for coming, Veronica. Yeah, I'm super excited to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Of course. Um, so uh, my first question for you is uh, what got you started in this field? So I became interested in studying assistive technology when I was in early high school. Uh, there was an incident where my school district failed to order me accessible textbooks for an entire semester. At that point, my vision had changed a lot in the span of a year, and I knew that my vision loss kept me from being able to read the standard sized print in textbooks, but I wasn't quite sure what an accessible textbook would look like for me either with all of these new vision changes. Since I never had textbooks in middle school, I didn't really know anything about accessible textbooks. My school district showed me several options for accessing textbooks and for accessible textbooks, many of which were not a good option for me. And at that point, I started to learn more about things like accessible formats, how to make accessible documents, and eventually learning how to describe what accessible materials look like for me. The exact day I decided to study assistive technology, though, was the day that I went to a disability conference at George Mason University in Virginia. And I learned that accessible textbooks actually existed. 
And I learned a lot about how assistive technology in general could help people with disabilities to have so many more opportunities, both in school, in the workplace and beyond. From that day on, I love to tell people that I plan to go to George Mason and study assistive technology. And a few years later, I entered their assistive technology minor program. And I also entered the computer science major, though later changed my major to data science with the assistive technology minor. So as far as how I got started in the field professionally though, George Mason is one of the only schools in the United States that allows undergraduates to study assistive technology. And I had the opportunity to start taking assistive technology classes during my freshman year. Because I had this foundation in understanding assistive technology and accessibility, I was able to learn more about accessibility and assistive technology in the context of a lot of my other classes such as learning how to create accessible data visualizations and improving data visualizations for users with low vision. I learned how to create accessible websites, accessible documents, how to access math with low vision. I've been able to study disability law and policy, look at how audio description is used in theater, and so many more amazing projects. One of the main ways that I like to share the things that I have learned about assistive technology and accessibility is through my website, Veronica with Four Eyes, which I started from my dorm room in 2016 with encouragement from my family, my friends, and mentors in the field. I have hundreds of posts on my website about topics related to low vision and assistive technology. And through Veronica with Four Eyes, I've been able to make connections with people from all around the world, speak on topics that are important to me, and help to address knowledge gaps that people have about assistive technology and what it's like to live with low vision. I'm proud to say that I've been able to help students from all around the world, but I'm most proud to have been able to help students in my hometown and the great state of Virginia. That's really incredible. Um, and you mentioned a lot about uh, the fact that you minored in a set of technology, and there might be some people in the crowd who are fairly new to, uh, they might be new employer uh, who hired someone with a visual impairment, um, or they might be a, uh, someone who just want to learn more about what it's like uh, being a person with a visual impairment. Uh, to them, um, how would you define what assistive technology means? So I have my own personal definition of what assistive technology is, but I think it might be helpful to read the legal definition as well. So the Technology Related Assistance to Individuals with Disabilities Act of 1988, also known as the Tech Act, defines an assistive technology device as any item, piece of equipment or product system, whether acquired commercially off the shelf, modified or customized, that is used to increase, maintain or improve functional capabilities of individuals with disabilities. The Tech Act also defines an assistive technology service as any service that directly assists an individual with a disability in selection, acquisition or use of an assistive technology device. So outside of the legal definition, I like to tell people that assistive technology is any tool that can promote independence and empowerment of people with disabilities, allowing them to achieve things that may not be possible otherwise. A common stereotype about assistive technology is that people use it as a crutch or that it gives people an unfair advantage. But the truth is it can make things so much more possible. When I work with young students or with people who are new to vision loss, we play a game called AT Wizard, where they tell me about barriers that they encounter in the, their day-to-day -day life, such as small print on the computer, issues with finding the classroom, trouble with reading a book, or sensitivity to brown, bright lights. And then I show them how there's assistive technology tools that are out there that can help them to solve these problems or make them easier. There's large print and screen magnification. There's adjustable stands for being able to read a book. There's mobility aids that can help with being able to navigate unfamiliar environments more easily, as well as wayfinding services. And there's also simple environmental adaptations that they can talk about with their teachers or other adults. It's amazing to see the students' excited expressions when they realize that there are so many options for making their world more accessible. And I think that's something important for employers as well is to realize that there's been a lot of like movement in the field of assistive technology and there are so many things out there that can help with solving everyday problems. 
I absolutely love your definition of uh, assistive technology being something that promote independence. Uh, I know when I talk to people about my job, especially a lot of typically sighted people, they're like, what you do? Uh, what do you do all day? And, uh, you know, I, you know, in the simplest term, I explain that I work with people with visual impairment on the computer and cell phone. Uh, but really so much more than that. It, uh, you know, as you mentioned, being able to navigate around uh, that assistive technology. Uh, I even consider taking Uber and Lyft as a um, assistive technology for transportation. Um, and you mentioned the uh, legal definition of assistive technology uh, is encoded in the law. And one of those landmark laws is the ADA, the American with Disability Act. Uh, what does the ADA require that employer do in regard to assistive technology? So the ADA states that employees can be provided reasonable accommodations in the workplace, which can include things like modifying documents to be in an accessible format, providing people to read things, and also providing assistive technology for employers as needed and when appropriate, with no additional cost to the employee. It also protects against discrimination on the basis of disability in the workplace, as well as with hiring and firing practices. So I would say a good example of looking at assistive technology in the workplace would be through looking through websites connected with the US government, such as the USDA Target Center or the DOD CAP Center, which can provide ideas of what reasonable accommodations would look like for people with a variety of dis different disabilities. When I interned at a major tech company two years ago, some examples of assistive technology I had included adjustable desks and screens, so that way I could easily align my screen with my glasses or with the bifocal in the lower part of my glasses. It was darkening uh, curtains, so that way I wouldn't have to deal with outside light or a surprise lightning storm, or as I put it, nature's strobe lights. And I also was able to get access to a computer that had various assistive technology tools built in, such as a screen magnifier and a high contrast mode. So having access to a lot of those tools was very important for me. That's incredible. And I know for uh, speaking for my students, uh, you know, they use all sorts of technology that can also be screen readers and braille displays as well. And I know you mentioned um, that there's no cost to the employee with a disability. Uh, generally speaking, what would you say the cost to an employer um, who'd looking to hire someone with a disability? So it's hard for me to answer that question because I have never been an employer or in a position where I was the one purchasing said assistive technology. However, I think an important thing to look at it is being able to invest in their employees. Employers need to be able to invest in their employees to ensure their max productivity and to allow the employees to be able to showcase their skills and what they really know. Now, for example, the JAWS screen reader, one of the most popular screen readers costs $900 a year, I believe, for most licenses. Now, $900 may seem like a lot, but it can enable people who are amazingly talented with subjects like software engineering or with documentation for being able to type lots of things and reading, it can allow them to be able to achieve amazing things and to be able to do their job and to show that they really are the best candidate for this job. So the $900 investment allows people to find people that really thrive and to find people that would really be able to do the job better than anybody else. I know that there are grant programs that exist as well as in some states for taxes for being able to get assistive technology written off. I know there was a proposed law in the United States Congress to help with writing off taxes for up to $700 in assistive technology. I do not know the status of that off the top of my head, but there are options for being able to get funding. And for people working for the federal government, there's also grants as well for being able to get technology. That's incredible. And I know uh, the federal government has um, put the higher priority on placing, uh, hiring people with disabilities to the a good place for people to check out if anyone's looking for a job. Um, you know, in today's culture, we're talking a lot about 
how to be an effective ally um, to anyone. Um, but particularly uh, today, I want to talk about um, how can a coworker uh, be um, supportive of a colleague who has a visual impairment? How can they best support them? That's a really awesome question. I think one of the best ways that my coworkers supported me in my various roles was by taking the time to learn things. So before I started my internship at a major tech company, uh, someone from the Lighthouse for the Blind in our area came over and talked to the people about how to be an effective human guide for being able to guide someone around an area. They talked about what it's like to have low vision versus blindness and how the two are different, as well as other things such as accessible formats and being able to identify people. So the importance of going, hi, my name is Veronica and I'm on your left, as opposed to, hey, don't you know who I am? I'm over here, which can be really disorienting for someone who's new to a job and trying to figure out where are you? Who are you? This is cool. <laughs> So I would say that taking the time to learn how to be a good ally through websites or through in-person trainings or even virtual trainings would be a great thing. I would focus a lot if you are working with someone in person on being able to learn things like how to be a human guide or how to speak up for inaccessible formats and how to make sure that people can access all materials. Uh, for people working virtually, I would say again, learning how to create accessible materials would be very important and ensuring that uh, documents that are sent out can be read by anyone, including assistive technology devices, as well as learning uh, simple things that can aggravate uh, conditions with vision loss. For example, some people find virtual backgrounds very disorienting because they can flicker in the background or the patterns can be very hard to focus on. So I think that being able to figure out those things is a great step to allyship as well. Those are all wonderful ideas and um... I love them. Uh, I'd also add, uh, you know, just talking to the person. Every person, visual impairment is different and impact them in different ways. And um, you know, being a colleague is also being a team player and getting to know the person, know their strengths and weaknesses, and supporting each other. Um, that the you know that the best kind of uh, team to be on is one that support one another. Uh, I know I'm fortunate enough to be on such a team. Uh, you mentioned navigating around and uh, doing sighted guide and everyone should definitely learn that. Uh, I know when I first started, um, I had a boss who was new to sighted guide and uh, I definitely displayed a lot of patients, um, you know, navigating around um, and uh, they're quite effective at it nowadays. It's set in nature to them. Uh, so these things can be intimidating in the beginning and it okay, mess up, uh, you know, with visual impairment, hopefully we'll be forgiving and speak up and say, oh, try this way and not that way uh, and figure it out. Um, in addition to Sighted Guide, which is a wonderful tool, um, do you have any recommendations around assistive technology to help someone with a visual impairment navigate uh, around? So there's a couple of suggestions that come to mind. I'm assuming that most people would already use something like a blindness cane or a guide dog when I'm making these suggestions, but I would say that's probably really useful. If you are scared of using a blindness cane because you're worried you aren't blind enough, if you're running into a lot of walls or if you're not sure you can cross a crowded street and think you can listen for cars, please get a cane. I previously thought that I could also listen for cars and my mom had announced that she couldn't wait to hear that I had been hit by a Prius and that she was right all along that my vision was worse than I thought. So I thought of that one with when I had to start using a cane my first day of college. And anyway, moving on from that, a couple of other things that helped me when I was learning how to navigate uh, my new environments were looking for visual landmarks. Well, I may not be able to see them clearly. I know like, okay, we turn left at the red painting or we go all the way to the shelf on the end of the end of the hallway and take a left. If you reach the giant statue of a dog, you've gone too far. So that type of thing with looking for visual landmarks as well as using wayfinding services such as Ira, Be My Eyes, Be Specular, various other visual guides that can be able to help people with navigating indoor environments. So those are really helpful to have as well. 
Of course, having a human guide is also really great for being able to have an extra pair of eyes on an environment. This is especially helpful when crossing the street. And I would say another thing that's really helpful is just walking around with another sighted person and being able to get used to walking various routes. Uh, one of my friends and I would do that with classes on our college campus with making sure that we knew how to get in between buildings and things like that. That's amazing. Uh, and I know in addition to visual landmark, the auditory landmark, you know, for instance, a refrigerator in a particular area or a tactile landmark, if you're using that cane, uh, effectively, you'll be able to feel changes in the uh, ground, you know, from a tile floor to a concrete floor or um, so on. Um, Those are really effective way to pick up on landmarks. Um, you mentioned IRA and Be My Eyes. Not everyone might know what those are. Can you explain a little further on what those are? Sure. They're phone apps that allow users to uh, get guidance from another human on the other end of the phone. So you hold up your phone camera and a person is able to connect remotely and be able to give you guidance on how to navigate something or they can help you with reading, product identification or things like that. Uh, for product identification though, I tend to recommend other apps that use AI, which I'll talk about a little bit more later on. That's awesome. Uh, I know I use Ira even just to call up an Uber um, because they'll do it for you connect right into the app. Uh, and it's so nice uh, to have someone there on the phone to be like, uh, yeah, I read the lightning plate, that's the right Uber, you're good to go. Um, it's a lot more reassuring when you uh, when a random car pulls up and you, you know you're uh, getting into the right one and that you're gonna be all set. Um, there are a set of technology to help people out their work plate attire as well, right? Yeah, that's actually the apps I was just talking about. There's uh, AI apps such as Microsoft Seeing AI or Google Lens that are able to identify colors and patterns as well as types of clothing. So those are really helpful. Uh, one of my favorite apps though, that's a form of assistive technology is called Stylebook, which allows people to create a digital form of their closet and put together outfits and things like that. You can also make notes such as care instructions for clothing, or where it's located, which can be really helpful if I'm trying to track down a dress and it's like, oh, it's actually sitting in a place that I can't access right now. So I shouldn't think of that as an option for what to wear today. So I would say style book is probably my favorite because I can also enlarge clothing really easily and more easily see what goes together in a certain outfit. So I can look and go, huh, maybe these earrings do go with this dress or maybe they don't. When I'm able to have it more easily enlarged, I can really make those decisions. That's amazing. And I know, uh, you know, we talk a lot about high tech when we're talking about assistive technology, but there's a low tech solutions like uh, braille labels um, in that you can place inside clothing. They'll tell you uh, what color it is, if, if it has a pattern. Um, you know, a lot of uh, people with visual impairment use organization. Um, to help them as well, uh, separating out by category. Um, and if you like me, uh, you like to cheat and uh, wear a very uh, basic bottom that uh, matches everything, you know, jeans match any top. Um, so you're all set no matter what you're trying to pick out. Yeah, that's another really helpful option as well. Um, my mom also would do something where she would use a Sharpie to be able to mark whether clothing went in warm water or cold water, which would be really helpful to be able to look at and see if something had a W or a C written on it. So another uh, assistive tech tool I use actually is instead of trying to figure out how to measure out laundry soap, I just get the uh, little Tide Pods. So that way I can just throw them in and not have to worry about whether I've correctly uh, measured out detergent or not, or whether everything will be turning a different color when I take it out of the washing machine. That's a great strategy. Um, and I know uh, for myself, um, you know, they do have uh, the vibrating uh, prong that uh, when a cup gets so high, it'll start uh, beeping or vibrating uh, to let you know that you're near the top of the cup. Uh, that's great. And I know uh, I, my washing machine adapted with, um, uh, you know, marker, tactile bump dots uh, so that I know where to turn the dial 
um, when I'm watching codes. If I want a heavy duty load for my towel or a lighter load for, um, you know, uh, work plate attire. It's worth noting, um, just one more thing on the beeping uh, drink alert. I Well, please don't drink laundry detergent, but they're called <laughs> like the drink alert uh, devices is that they may be banned or frowned upon at certain colleges because the beeping effect can sound like the fire alarm. Oh, wow. I've so never heard that before. Depending on how high pitched the beeping is, uh, they may not be allowed in the dining hall or in uh, the laundry room or things like that because the sound can vaguely sound like the fire alarm. That made sense. Um, but yeah, I'd never thought of that before. Uh, you know, what we, they do have some vibrating ones. So if you're someone out there in college um, or in a dorm setting, uh, make sure you get a vibrating one, uh, you know, so that people feel safe and don't get anxious and run out the front door. <laughs> um, <laughs> what about um, assistive technology for reading print? Obviously in the workplace, um, you don't come across a lot of print materials. Uh, what would you recommend for someone who needs help reading print? So I'm going to assume this would be for reading digital print for the most part to start out with this question. Some of my favorite tools include simplified reading displays such as Microsoft Immersive Reader or other displays that can strip the formatting of a page so that way you can read only the text and you can adjust it accordingly to your own desires for what you want with contrast or with the font size. There's also good old control plus that is the shortcut to be able to zoom in on text on an HTML document PDF or other web pages. That's really helpful to have as is being able to use magnifier or zoom text or zoom or similar magnification programs, as well as looking at display scaling for the uh, computer screen, which I have mine enlarged to 150%. So that way it doesn't mess with any other applications, but still allows me to see text fairly large. So I would say that a combination of all of those things, you can encounter almost any print. Now for physical print, uh, some of my favorite tools have included uh, scanners like OCR scanners with office lens or similar products to be able to scan in a document and have it read out loud to me. Uh, you can also use scanning pens. I have the scan marker air, which doesn't save uh, the device or the tools that are scanned in. You can just run the pen across a line of text and it will read it out loud for you. I talk about it more on a post on my website. And there is a couple of other apps as well that can provide similar tools with OCR. That tends to be my preferred thing. You can also use uh, CCTVs and video magnifiers to be able to hold pages underneath a screen or underneath a camera and it will display on a screen. That's what I use a lot for uh, testing in college as well as for being able to read documents that I may not need to reference later. And you can also look into uh, being able to have items scanned in as Word documents and things like that so you can save them for later. That's incredible. Uh, it's so amazing how nowadays did so many option for converting uh, the printed word into um, any kind of format. It could be in large, color inverted, auditory, like a screen reader reading it, or even braille, a braille display reading a certain piece of text. Never been easier to convert from print to braille. Um, for uh, someone who, faces, who um, has a visual impairment and comes across an inaccessible PDF, how would you make it acceptable? For someone who comes across what? An inaccessible PDF. Uh, how do they convert it? So for an inaccessible PDF, I would say probably the first thing they should do is know what will not make a PDF accessible. That can include things like taking a screenshot of the PDF and stretching it out so it seems larger. That will remove all of the alt text and other text attributes and will not actually be helpful. Uh, another one would be trying to like copy and paste text, which may not necessarily work all the time. It can actually mess with formatting. Some of my favorite ways to make uh, inaccessible PDFs accessible is opening them within an application such as Microsoft Word or Google Docs. So you can open a PDF in those, in those programs and it will be able to 
display the PDF with text in it. So that way you can read along with it as you traditionally would any other docx document. You can also open them in a lot of web browsers to be able to have more control over Zoom and things like that. And you can also, if I believe you can do uh, tagged PDFs, that's an option for being able to request accessible formats, although I'm not 100% sure how that process works. That's amazing. Um, and I know personally, um, you know, JAWS has a really nice um, built in feature called convenient OCR, uh, where you can uh, have JAWS convert the inaccessible PDF into written word and uh, you can even copy and paste, you can read through it. Uh, it's amazing technology uh, built right in. And then, um, you know, I like to use Void Dream Scanner. It's a particular app that, an OCR app that will allow you to uh, upload a document and scan it through. Um, I know sometimes in certain courses I've taken, uh, I'll come across a PDF that's been scanned in, basically uh, it would just an image capture. Um, and so my screen reader, when it goes in, it just says graph it and totally devoid of any useful information. And so sometimes I like upload it into Void Dream Scanner and be able to read along and uh, figure out what is that the PDF is all about. Um, what else uh, should we know about assistive technology? So one of the things that comes to mind is that assistive technology shouldn't be thought of as a pair of crutches, but rather a pair of wings. I know that a lot of people sometimes panic over how they've become so reliant on their blindness cane or with large print and they're wondering, wow, am I somehow secretly faking my disability or am I, dealing, am I just exaggerating? Is this not as bad as it is? Or what if I went without this assistive technology? And as someone who went through all of those emotions with a variety of different tools, uh, my best advice for that is don't feel bad. Your assistive technology makes so many things possible. It's not just making them easier, it is making them possible. Be able to embrace using your assistive technology and the tools you need to be successful. If you have to strain so to see something, you can't see it. That's how I like to phrase things as well, with the reminder of if I have to put myself through large amounts of pain, it's probably not something I should be doing. There's a lot of tools out there that can make these things possible and assistive technology is one of the main tools that people can use to be successful. The future is accessible. Let's embrace it. That's incredible. And I love your point about visual impairment being a spectrum. Uh, you know, uh, I have students uh, who range the whole gauntlet from, you know, no vision whatsoever to um, a lot of usable vision who should need, you know, a simple accommodation here and there. Um, and no matter what, we're all one big group and we're working together and making sure that things are acceptable and people are able to ask whatever assistive technology that will enable them, empower them, help them get jobs, uh, help them even in their personal lives, uh, no matter what it is. Uh, thank you, Veronica. Um, and with that, I'm gonna turn it over for some Q and A uh, with um, Alicia Smith. Uh, hopefully she'll be able to come up with a, a question from the audience. Great, thanks Brian and thanks so much Veronica for sharing everything so far. We do in fact have a couple of questions. Um, so I'll start with one which is um, about being supportive of colleagues. Um, it reads, I always want to help and be supportive but I find myself not asking questions sometimes because I'm afraid it would be an offensive question or a quote unquote stupid question. Are there better ways to approach situations, excuse me, to approach questions that will show that I want to help, but I just do not have the experience? So I would say that there's probably no such thing as stupid questions in this case, if you're thinking about whether you should ask them. Uh, believe me, there have been lots of strange questions that people have asked me about my disability in the past. Whatever question you have probably can't top those. <laughs> I would say to be able to make sure you're asking questions genuinely from a point of wanting to help and not just from a point of trying to satisfy some narrative that you have about disability. It's okay to ask me about my blindness cane and how I use it. 
if there's a way that you can help to guide me. I would say just ask, don't grab would probably be the most valuable advice for someone with a blindness game. It's okay to ask how people use assistive technology if you're looking at it from a point where you'd be able to help them. I would say avoid questions that sort of just satisfy some strange personal curiosity. For example, I had someone ask me if I brought my blindness cane in the bathroom or in the shower with me, which was a really uncomfortable question to be asked by someone and other questions that just made me feel unsafe or things like that. Trust me, I think if you're thinking about what questions you should ask and how you can come from a place of being able to help, then there's no such thing as a stupid question. I love it. Thank you, Veronica. Um, we have a question that says, what is the right way to educate someone about your visual impairment? And is there an easier way to approach on what you want them to know? So I would assume this is a person you would be interacting with frequently and not necessarily just someone you're meeting once or twice. So for me, one of the things that has helped is being able to have sample images of how I see. So I've created these in an app called PixArt, which shows that I see a double blurry disoriented images. This might be a lot easier for people who have no usable vision, but I have found that being able to have these images allows people to see, okay, this is what different things look like to Veronica. I can be able to help her this way. So those have been really helpful or being able to explain ways that I see better. For example, instead of saying, I can't see in the dark, I could say, hey, uh, are we able to turn on some more lights in here? So that way I can be able to navigate through here or just looking at simple adaptations like that. So with my visual impairment, it doesn't necessarily, let me back that up. So it's not a condition where you would read the name of this and go, yes, you're going to see this way. And I couldn't walk up to a teacher that visually impaired and have them go, yes, I'm super familiar with this condition. Let's work with this. Cause I actually have a combination of three different eye conditions, none of which typically are associated with low vision. So for me, just saying the name of a diagnosis doesn't work. What does help is being able to show people, these are the environmental adaptations that help me to be successful and here is how you can be a good ally for being able to ensure these accommodations are in place. I totally agree. And I know uh, for myself, uh, if people read the diagnosis, uh, it might we throw them off a little bit. Um, I am, you know, tet book, genetic tested, definitely 100% have Utter syndrome type 2A. Um, but people, even people who are familiar with it, they'll say, well, you know, most people with the condition, they go blind later in life. They have some usable vision through the 20s and sometimes even into the 30s. And um, I know for me, I'm like, well, I don't. Um, unfortunately, you know, it progresses at different rate for different people. And I've met people who've gone blind from the condition even younger than myself. And so um, that example can be a little bit misleading um, at great as they are. Um, so it's definitely important to talk to the person and learn more about them as an individual and more about their visual impairment. Uh, that's awesome. Veronica, Oicha, do you have another question? I do have a couple more. Um, two questions are on um, accessible materials. The first one asks, what would you say is the biggest pet peeve you come across in non-accessible PDF documents? I would say the example I gave earlier where the document is scanned in without any other text added. So it's just like I would go to pull up a PDF and it's just a blurry image that I'm unable to enlarge correctly would probably be my biggest PD pet peeve about PDFs. I agree with that. Uh, yeah, those uh, scanned in PDF are really annoying. Great. I would also say as another one, it's PDFs that it's like you're scanning in a copy of a copy. So the contrast is really bad and you're unable to apply other magnification filters to be able to read the text clearly. That's great to know. Um, the next question concerns social media. It says in social media, I use alt text but often find it difficult to explain the image or video because it involves colors 
Any suggestions on how to better use alt text in explaining an image? Yay for using alt text. That's one of the things I'm the most passionate about because it is huge for being able to help people with accessing social media. As for colors, I'm not sure what exactly you're posting on social media, but for the most part, you don't need to describe what colors look like. For example, I know what the color red looks like. There's no need to try to explain to me the color red like I've never seen it before. If you're posting on social media about things such as color palettes or where color names might be more sensitive, you can just stick with general names. For example, I'm wearing a navy blue sweater. That would be fine to write, just the shade name. Or if it was in maybe a more unfamiliar color or something that people might not recognize, you could write something like a very dark orange or maybe pumpkin orange or shades like that. Give people something like that. You don't need to over describe what a color looks like. That's great advice. Uh, and I know uh, the most important thing is try and get the main point across, um, you know, who's in the image, um, what they're wearing, uh, what what are they doing? Uh, you know, why did you decide to share the particular picture over another one? You know, uh, what kind of point are you trying to get across with the picture? Um, that can be all really helpful information in an alt text. I have a couple of alt text guides listed on my website as well. So you can feel free to check those out. Excellent. Um, those are all the questions we have in the Q&A. I can keep monitoring it for the next few minutes if um, anybody would like to submit a question. That sounds wonderful. Uh, hopefully people will submit some questions and we do let us know each of uh, people do submit uh, more questions. Um, Veronica, uh, what's your favorite um, technology app that you found to be uh, useful? My favorite assistive technology app. Oh, that's really hard. <laughs> uh, hmm. For right now, I would say one of my favorite assistive technology apps on my phone has to be the big font extension for being able to enlarge the text even more because that enables me to be able to use my phone without a screen reader. I'm able to access it with size 36 point font across all of my applications and it looks awesome. So that's probably my favorite app because it enables me to be able to do so many things and acts as an extension for the other assistive technology apps. Uh, for my computer, probably one of my most used things right now is keyboard shortcuts with being able to create custom keyboard shortcuts to be able to open applications so I don't have to scroll through the start menu or look for icons. I can just easily click three buttons and then I'm in whatever app I want to be in. As for my iPad, my favorite app right now Oh, that's really hard too. <laughs> I've been exploring a lot of stuff with um, simplified reading displays. So it's hard for me to pick a favorite right now as I've been exploring that. But my favorite built in iOS feature right now is reading view to be able to uh, read websites with a more simplified display. So I don't have to worry about flashing ads and things like that. That's been a really helpful tool to have, especially when doing work about uh, studying iOS accessibility. No, you mentioned um the fact that simplified, simplified reading view uh, get rid of advertisement. Um, what else uh, does simplified reading view do for those who might not be familiar with this? So it provides a consistent formatting. So everything is within, like within a center margin or left margin. So that way it's easier to read. It can change the background of the text. So that way it's a shaded color instead of being a sharp white. Uh, you can also change the font and the font size, which I think is really helpful. Uh, if you want to see an example of it, um, my website is a really good test case for showing off reading view in a simplified way for being able to show uh, what the colors look like. I don't have any ads on my website or anything like that, so I guess it doesn't show that part of it. But if you're just looking for a straight piece of text to read, that would be a really good place to start. That's incredible. Uh, and earlier we were talking about different colors. Um, you know, you mentioned uh, being able to see different colors. 
Uh, when we're talking about workplace attire, are there any technology that can help people identify different colors of their clothing? Yeah, I would say that there are. there's a built-in color reader to the Seeing AI app that I've found works really well. You can also get dedicated color readers where you could point it at something and it would tell you what color it is. I liked your solution though with being able to mix and match uh, basic pieces of clothing as well. Like for example, buying maybe all neutral tops or all neutral bottoms and then having one piece of color in your wardrobe. So that way you could mix and match and things like that. So that way you're not relegated to only wearing like black and white or other basic colors. So I found the Stylebook app to be the most helpful though because I'm able to identify colors more easily on that. Although I have no deficiencies with my color vision outside of contrast deficiencies with like paper and things like that. That's easy enough for me to say uh, what we had men were able, uh, you know, get away with um, being less stylish uh, as an individual. Um, then our female or female identifying uh, friends. Um, Brian, sorry to interrupt, but we do have a few questions from the audience. Um, one says, for learning tools and systems, what is the best accessibility tool for a video demo? Example, Salesforce. Do you want to repeat the question, Alicia? Sure. I believe the question is regarding uh, accessibility tools for videos, video demonstrations uh, for learning or training. So I'm not sure if this is the exact answer you're looking for, but audio description can be a great tool for describing visual information in a non-visual way, as well as including video transcripts that can be inclusive of scene descriptions, such as what would be written in an audio description, as well as the text that is spoken or written on the screen. I would say having access to those tools would be very important. However, I do not have a lot of experience with Salesforce as a platform. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Salesforce is a um, CMS and it's a very accessible one. Um, you can use a lot of your um, different HTML uh, jog keys, MVDA keys, uh, VO keys uh, to be able to quickly navigate it. Um, it's a platform where you're able to pull up uh, customer information uh, and we actually train a lot of people in Korea launch on how to effectively use it um, in order to work with uh, customers and one-to-one -one interaction, uh, receiving phone calls, getting email, and then they pull up the customer information in Salesforce. Um, and it's almost like you're talking to someone who knows you um, intimately uh, because they have access to all of your prior information. They know what you ordered from the company previously. They know uh, where you booked the last time you stayed. And so we train our trainee to be wonderful customer success uh, employees and they're able to effectively pull up the customer information and let them know, um, you know, last time you stayed here. Uh, I know you'll be traveling with a guide dog. How can we best assist you? Um, it's a wonderful platform, very acceptable. Um, and I know they have a acceptability line, which is great. Uh, every major company should have someone who people can reach out to in acceptability. Um, so definitely check out Salesforce. I have an entire blog post about accessibility phone numbers for popular customer technology things such as Apple, Microsoft, and Google. You can find a link to that on my website. You can also use tools such as Be My Eyes Specialized Help to be able to reach a lot of these accessibility phone numbers, which is very helpful when you're having an issue with your computer freezing on 1600% magnification or dealing with uh, trying to set up Zoom on an iPad. Highly recommend trying those phone numbers. Oh yeah. Uh, you know, I work with all of our students and getting them comfortable making that phone call. Um, even if the issue is not necessarily an AT issue, um, it's so great having that person on the other end to help you navigate and troubleshoot and uh, figure out what your issue is. Absolutely. Great. I think maybe a couple more questions here. Um, what is this one reads, what is a time that you've had to say no to someone because you couldn't access or do 
the thing that they were asking you. So one example of this is I was asked to review content for accessibility that contained a large amount of strobe and flashing lights. So I have a medical condition that is aggravated by said lights and they had the person I reached out to me with the intention that, hey, if you're really knowledgeable about these lights, you'd be able to tell me if someone would get sick from this. Well, I don't feel comfortable finding that out by getting sick myself. <laughs> So I ended up having to turn down that request and referring them to looking at other readings on how to judge whether material would aggravate people who were photosensitive or not. I don't blame you for not wanting to be the uh, test mouse on that little science experiment. Um, I know for me, I, you know, mo often I don't say no, but I, uh, you know, give them feedback, tell them uh, maybe how they can better support me so that I can support them uh, and figure out a work around. Uh, I'm big into figuring out work around for a different thing um, and finding, figuring out ways to be able to accomplish the same task, even if you take a different route than uh, what your typically cited colleague might be able to do the task. Um, I, Alicia, is that all the questions? There are several more. Um, I don't know if you want to do one or two quick ones or if we need to wrap up. Leave it up we can do you. one quick one and then we'll uh, wrap it up. Okay, a very quick one. Um, uh, somebody is saying that this has been so helpful because they've recently been certified as legally blind. Are there any recommendations you have for technology when it comes to traveling? So for technology, some of my favorite tools to use for traveling include uh, my mobility aids. So I use a uh, blindness cane as well as using uh, wayfinding tools, again, such as IREB, which has maps of a lot of airports and things like that. Other tools which can be really helpful include uh, being able to access hotel apps and being able to get information in a screen reader friendly application. I know the Marriott app was accessible when I was using it a few months ago. So that way I could get into my room without having to worry about finding the key. Uh, let's think, just, I have an entire uh, dedicated category to travel on my website, which can perhaps answer these questions a little bit more in depth and talk more about how I get through. Oh, actually there is another thing as well. Uh, if you're traveling domestically within the United States, the TSA pre-check is not technically a piece of assistive technology, but it is a way to help simplify the process with getting through the TSA. So you don't have to worry about taking off your shoes or taking everything out of your carry-on and things like that. That's a really helpful tool to have. It's about $16 a year. And it's been really helpful for me to be able to get through TSA screening in literally less than a minute in one of the busiest airports in the country. That's amazing. I need any in all help getting through an airport. I know one time I went through and they made me put my uh, cane through the X-ray machine and they just left me there and they're like, <laughs> walk through the X-ray machine. Um, and I was like, where am I going? And they're like, oh, we didn't realize you were blind blind. <laughs> uh, and then I got into the machine and they told me step on the yellow footprints, uh, which I couldn't see. Uh, so then they pulled me aside and I got go through uh, with uh, you know, uh, with the wand, um, and that was a more effective way. But I know going through TSA can be quite a nightmare uh, for those of us with visual impairment, and obviously it's anxiety provoking for everyone as well. Yeah. Um, One of my friends was wearing socks um, underneath their shoes and ended up slipping and falling trying to find the uh, place to go through the metal detector. So after that, they got the TSA pre-check and said that alone was worth the money. <laughs> Definitely. Uh, everyone should get the TSA pre-check. And uh, thank you so much, Veronica, for coming today. We're delighted that you were able to spend some time and chat with us. Um, if people want to check out more about Career Launch, you can check out our website. We'll have the, this recording up on the website. Um, so feel free to look back. Uh, we covered a lot of information. Uh, so feel free to watch in 0.5 at mode and uh, learn more about Career Launch and uh, all the great and wonderful technology that's out there. Thank you, everyone.